seems ironic that while our finest young men are fighting halfway across the world, other young men and women, safe at home, openly advocate abandonment of Vietnam to communism. Perhaps they really don't know what this war is all about. In the words of a battle-weary young Marine, they would understand if they'd cross this 10,000 miles of ocean and live with us. A day in Vietnam. This day, this trip, is not to delineate the why of Vietnam. Rather, it is to see the what and the how of our military operations, to give you a deeper insight into this war and the way it is being fought. While the coordinated effort of all Americans in Vietnam is vital to success, it is the young men of our Navy Marine Corps team that we will see firsthand today, down there in Vietnam. We've landed on the big airfield at Da Nang and will travel directly to the headquarters of the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force for a briefing by the operations officer. Gentlemen, I will give you a brief rundown on our present status in Vietnam together with a thumbnail sketch of the initial landings and subsequent buildup. As you can see on this map, the 17th parallel divides North Vietnam from South Vietnam. Militarily speaking, South Vietnam is divided into four areas. The fourth core area in the South, the third core, the second core, and in the North, the first core, or as we call it, the i core area. The area within this i core is approximately 10,000 square miles with a beach line or coastline of 167 miles. The third marine amphibious force is responsible for all United States military operations in the i core area. Located here in about the center of the i core area is our major operational base of Da Nang. You will recall that it was at Da Nang that the initial landings were made by the 9th Marine Expeditionary Brigade. This is now our largest operational base. At about here, approximately 50 miles to the south of Da Nang, is the operational base at Chula. The Marines and the Seabees have built a small airfield for tactical support. Our third operational base is approximately 45 miles to the north of Da Nang. It is the base at Wei Fuba. Now, although the bulk of our Marines are located in or around these three bases, I want to point out that the Marines of the 3rd Amphibious Force have been fighting from one end of the i corps area to the very other tip. With so many new and different things for you to see, it is difficult to sort them out in any order. However, it's quite easy to choose what you should see first. Our Marines, they're the finest. These Marines have just returned from a tough battle in the north. They are now in a defensive perimeter. Their weapons are cleaned and cared for before a thought can be given to personal comfort a matter of importance in the life of a professional fighting man. This is neither a clean nor an easy life for our men, but they've learned to accept the physical hardships of battle as their fathers did before them. In their famous hymn, Marines recount battles fought in every clime and place. Here in Vietnam, except for snow, they prove it. From the soft ooze of the rice paddies, they move on through swift running canals and streams. Then push forward into the jungles that fringe the mountains, where elephant grass tears at the skin while vines tangle the feet and giant trees cut off the sun. But it's not just a matter of long walks in the tropical heat. Each and every step must be a cautious one 
where the Viet Cong have prepared the way with mines and booby traps. So watch your step. A false one in your ankle is pierced by the nails of a crudely cunning trap that only digs deeper as you fight to pull away. A hidden shell sits waiting for the unwary foot. And you'll never know which innocent looking piece of grass or fern covers a pit of sharpened poison tipped bamboo spikes. Marine engineers must constantly sweep the roads and trails in search of killer mines. Troops must provide a screen of security behind which Americans can assist the Vietnamese in the revolutionary rebuilding of their nation. It is necessary to constantly patrol the outlying villages and countryside to deny re-entry to the Viet Cong. Marines initiate literally hundreds of small patrols and ambushes throughout the I Corps area each week. But one of the most difficult jobs in this war without a front is to distinguish friend from foe. Each person must be carefully searched and identified. Whether VC are turned up by such scrutiny or captured in combat, they are treated with scrupulous fairness under the international rules of the Geneva Convention. Marines have found that such treatment of an often cruel enemy frequently results in the proffering of information that reveals the whereabouts of an enemy force. In possession of such knowledge, Marines react quickly. Plans are rapidly formulated and a striking force moves out swiftly. As they move in on the enemy position, they are met by intensive small arms fire. It results in some casualties, but the attack is carried to the enemy stronghold. The Viet Cong are well dug in. The command decision is to call for artillery fire support to dislodge them. The observer gives the exact location to ensure the safety of friendly elements close by. final assault and move in to destroy the enemy equipment and supplies. Many of the hamlets our troops approach are known to be friendly, but even they must be approached cautiously, for emotional reactions are primal when villagers are first confronted by men with weapons. A Vietnamese farmer's entire world is a thatched hut, a small rice paddy, his wife and children. For the past quarter of a century, his village has been a battleground, completely isolated by Viet Cong destroyed bridges and mined roads. The VC wanted food, they took his rice. They wanted soldiers, they shanghaied his sons. His village chief objected and was beheaded. His neighbors who protested were beaten. He can trust no one. The Viet Cong told him the Marines would come to seize homes, murder children, and enslave entire families. Anyone who helped Americans, the VC said, would be tortured and killed. So, quite naturally, trust and confidence grow slowly, nurtured by little acts of mercy, by promises fulfilled. Surely the stranger who binds one's wounds does not intend to murder, and always the Marine's first question is, what can we do to help you? Viet Cong have been driven out of the area. A combined action company is formed to provide security for the village. Marines and South Vietnamese popular forces, militiamen from the village, work and train together in this company. Their patrols and ambushes prevent Viet Cong reinfiltration. The villagers and their headman live unmolested.
With this security, fear is replaced by hope and the desire to build for the future. Marines work side by side with the village people, constructing churches, hospitals, and schools. American generosity provides the building tools, even the very bricks and mortar. Through many civic action funds, and the Marine Corps Reserve Care Program is one of them, Americans are giving unstintingly to help in this rebuilding of a nation and its people. In classrooms such as this, children, and adults too, are learning for the first time of the vast potentials of our free and democratic system. It is on this other front in the battle to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people that will be determined the kind of world their children, and our children too, will come to inherit. The Navy corpsman with his bar of soap and his bag of medical gear already is well loved by the Vietnamese people, symbol of America's helping hand. But he is only one of 100,000 Navy men committed to the war in Vietnam. For many of the Blue Jackets, it's an unusual new kind of shallow water warfare, operating fast, small boats, ground effects machines, and shallow draft transports. They hunt down and destroy the waterborne Viet Cong and act as advisors to the Vietnamese Navy as they move their troops along the water high roads for an attack on a riverside VC encampment. Just off the coast, other men of the Navy and Coast Guard are on constant patrol to stop and search thousands of small ships and junks. Many are carrying supplies intended for the Viet Cong. This blockade is known as Operation Market Time. It involves the surveillance of a thousand miles of coast from the 17th parallel to the Gulf of Siam. Tough duty, but it's drying up one arterial lifeline from North Vietnam. Offshore, in the deep blue of the China Sea, is the backbone of our Navy service forces, the aircraft carrier. It's a floating mobile airbase complex. Over 4,000 men live and work on this seagoing city. To keep the ship in operation and its pilots in the air requires the effort of a community of freemen, engineers, clerks, doctors, mechanics, pipe fitters, radar men, cooks, and bakers. Their working day averages 12 hours. It can be 18 or even longer when air operations are underway and planes are being sent aloft at 30 second intervals. Vietnam have been flown by Navy and Marine pilots. It's a dangerous job, and sometimes not all the planes come safely back. A search and rescue helicopter hurries on its way when that radio distress call, Mayday, signals a pilot in trouble. He could be down in the open sea or deep in the jungle. Their job is to find him and bring him back. On this mission, photographed by a Navy cameraman, the pilot was forced to eject beside a rocky cliff along the forbidding coastline a few miles south of Haiphong. The helicopter cannot get close enough for a direct lift, so a swimmer hits the water. and rescue is costly, difficult, and dangerous, but the value placed on a single life makes any effort worthwhile.
many other ships accompany the carrier. One such is the destroyer, the tin can, workhorse of the fleet. Indispensable to the Marines ashore and the Navy at sea. In Vietnam, the skillful placement of supporting fire and destroyers has often been a vital factor in the success of Marine infantry operations ashore. Another fleet operation in the South China Sea is the Amphibious Task Force. It supports teams of Marines and their helicopters that collectively are known as the Special Landing Force. The SLF operates from a specially designed ship that is a combination troop ship and helicopter carrier called an LPH. With almost lightning speed, the Special Landing Force can strike from the sky by helicopter and across the beach by amphibian vehicles in a highly effective two-pronged assault. The SLF has been employed at many points along the coast of South Vietnam. These Marines are part of the air attack group in the operation in which we're going to participate today. As they head toward land and a new battlefield, the minds of the fighting men are occupied with their own thoughts, their own prayers. Even for those who have taken part in many previous operations, the race toward a new unknown always carries with it that special feeling in the pit of the stomach. We fly above the beach assault force, for our helicopter landing zone is well inland, behind the enemy position. We expect to catch him by surprise. The helicopter force will block him from escaping toward the west, while the beach assault group offloads swiftly, then moves inland to play the hammer against the anvil. Marines push through the jungle, they must overcome natural obstacles as well as the enemy hiding someplace in the dense growth. A river to cross is a welcome coolness, but its waters support a myriad of leeches that slip inside clothing to fasten on the skin. The wounds they leave are easily infected in this tropical climate. In deep jungle ravines, the troopers slip down and climb back endlessly for every foot they advance. Now you are with them, and watch where you step and where you grab. A movement in the shadow beneath you could be a vicious giant rodent. A harmless looking vine might be a poisonous snake. Even the trees in this rainforest are hostile. They grow so thick their triple canopies bring darkness at noon. Hang on to the man in front of you, or you're lost in this midnight gloom. Then, suddenly, out of the misty darkness, contact. The enemy has good position and appears to be superior in numbers, so the Marines call in their equalizers, their support from the sky. This is the moment for which these pilots have been prepared, for which they've been ready and waiting. Approaching the target area, contact is made with the forward air controller. This Marine is an aviator attached to a ground unit. He gives the pilots all the information they need to provide pinpoint close air support for the ground troops, a Marine Corps specialty. needed to even up the odds, and the infantry action is positive and powerful in destroying the remaining enemy. We have our casualties, but our fatalities from combat-inflicted wounds
limbs have been cut to less than 2% because of the speed with which a wounded man can be moved from the battle zone to skilled surgical help. While the Navy corpsman gives emergency aid, a medivac team is being brought in by that mechanical angel of mercy called a helicopter. Usually less than 30 minutes after being hit, a seriously wounded man is in the operating room, either at a field hospital or aboard the USS Repose, a hospital ship that has been a welcome addition to our medical facilities in the combat zone. The gleaming white ship carries everything that would be found in the most modern hospital ashore. A full staff of doctors, nurses, and corpsmen functions with the same efficiency as the crew that moves the ship into the area where the action is. Though battle wounds are the cause of most of the serious casualties, there are many more that result from the environment. Heat prostration, immersion foot, malaria, these can be as devastating to our combat effectiveness as bullets or punjai pits. But the knowledge that quick and sure care is close at hand helps keep morale high in the rice paddies. But the Red Cross, which symbolizes our medical units, is not the only cross in Vietnam. Wherever the Marines and sailors go, the chaplain also goes. Whether it is for moral and spiritual counseling, a friendly word to a lonely man, or the softening of unpleasant news from home, the chaplain is on the scene. Be it a stretch of sand or a clearing in the jungle, it becomes a church as he sets up his altar. The men gather to worship in the same familiar routine of devotion as their families back home. As he holds service, the chaplain cannot dismiss the thought, will they all return? He knows full well they won't all come back alive. Prayers are said, a letter is written home to the family, yet so little can be done for this one who has given so much. There will be no more tales of his exciting adventure in a far off land. No more plans for his education, his family, his home. He may have been a lad, not quite a man in years, but he gave us a man's greatest treasure, his life. And he gave it not unknowingly. These men prove every day they understand the why of Vietnam. Listen to a few letters written home by these young men, some of whom have since been killed. Those boys were burning their draft cards, marching in protest, getting married, and hiding behind an education. You just show me that they aren't mature enough to accept the responsibility of being an American, and therefore they don't deserve to be called Americans. Mom, I don't want to die over here, but it is what it takes to make the world a better place for you and Dad and everyone to live, then giving my life won't be in vain. I try to love my fellow man, no matter who or what he is. I find it hard to believe that American men and women really object to U.S. servicemen being here in Vietnam. If those people who parade, protest, and tell us we are fighting a useless war had to live without their freedom, they change their point of view. Please don't think I'm trying to talk or act like a hero because I'm far from it. I'm just trying to do my part in this war. But it's a war that I'd gladly give my life for if it had helped bring freedom to the people here and help it grow stronger in our own country. The day I left home to come over here, I kissed my kids goodbye and my wife had tears in her eyes. I'm just like thousands of other servicemen here in Vietnam who dream of seeing our families and loved ones again. I do not wish to die here, but I have no fear of death. I know my God is real, and my trust and faith is in Him. Keep praying for me, as I shall pray for you. It's a lousy war, as is any war, but it's going to be fought sometime, someplace. I hate to see what it's doing to these poor people here in Vietnam, but I'd rather be here than in Minnesota. If and when my time to go comes, I will go. I'll go because I know the meaning of the word freedom. I'll go because 
I love my family, I love my country, and I love my God. Call it any name you will, from foolishness to sacrifice, but be sure to include love. This is the end of our day in Vietnam, a glimpse of the war as it is being waged all day, every day, by these young men who are growing up in a hurry. 18, 19, 20 years old, they were boys when they got here. They've become men overnight. The suffering, hardships, and sorrow they bear, not only their own, but what they see in others around them, has helped to make them compassionate, tolerant, and mature. The young men who comprise the vast bulk of our Navy and our Marine Corps, who are seldom seen on television, who are rarely interviewed by the press, these men are, as they have always been, the truly strong men of our nation. Only a couple of years ago, these young men would have been embarrassed to tell what patriotism meant to them, how much they loved their homes, their God, their country. Now they daily risk their lives for their beliefs. This vast cross-section of America, it's young, tired, gallant fighting men. This is not only the face of America, this is the heart of America. They will return, most of them, but that valiant heart will keep beating only if it is nourished and sustained by the rest of America. And these then are the true heroes of the war, the young men of your Navy and your Marine Corps. Whatever they are, and ultimately, whatever our country is, we owe to them and their brothers in the other services, past, present, 